Welcome to The Reason We Learn. Glad you are here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy, maybe it's a ride home, maybe it's the end of your day, I don't know, but thank you for joining us. I have a great topic for you today, school discipline, but before we get to that, I would like to ask you if it's your first time here, please consider subscribing to the channel if you're interested in topics such as these about education in America especially K through 12, but every so often we talk about higher education too. And this is not strictly public, also private school we talk about here. Um, if you're here already, please smash that like button so other people will see it in the recommendations and share it out to those who are parents who have kids in school and probably don't really know what goes on inside the school when it comes to discipline. Um, there's not a lot of transparency there. So we're going to we're going to shine a light on what does go on because I have a guest today who is a teacher. The other thing I'd like to invite you to do if you are considering leaving the school system is to join my locals at thereasonwelearn.locals.com. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my guest, Ryan Staley. Did I say it right? I keep I keep making you know mistakes with people's names. Is it Staley? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Yep. So Ryan is a teacher in a middle school, correct? Correct. Okay. And I've asked him to join us because he um, has talked to me in the past. He's been on this channel when we talked about what is not going on as far as academics in the schools. And he hinted at some discipline issues. And then he's corresponded with me over the past few months to alert me to some other things going on. And I thought, you know, we need to we need to talk about this. We need to alert the audience to what is happening in discipline um, in our public schools from a bird's eye view point, and that would be you because you're a teacher. So first, would you please tell the audience a little bit about your background in teaching and then bring us up to where you are now? So um, third generation educator, grandparents and, and parents were all educators. Um, uh, got my master's degree. Um, I actually spent a couple of years coaching collegiately and then came back and got my master's in elementary ed. And then I went into... Um, <clears throat> middle school, teaching sixth and seventh grade in an urban district in Illinois, and um, spent there a couple of years, then transferred to uh, the cat local Catholic high school um, and spent about five or six years teaching there, uh, teaching English to freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Um, then I went off to the university level where I created a collegiate pro athletics program and taught some classes there as well. And then we moved out of state and I find myself back at the middle school level teaching sixth and seventh graders in, in a different state. Um, but again, with another urban, urban environment, low socioeconomic group. So, um, so again, you know, my family's educators, my dad was a dean for a long time at the, low, at the public high school. So um, I, I would say one of my strengths in education is, is the discipline angle, even though I'm not perfect. Um, you know, but I've had some good private tutoring, especially in that, that department. So, mm -hmm. well, it's hard to be perfect, right? I mean, kids throw things at us and even when you're, when you're a parent, discipline is yeah. challenging with your own children. So now you have a room full of them and I'm yeah. sure it's literally, literally throwing stuff. Literally. Right literally. Throwing oh stuff boy. Right so. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. So, um, on the channel, I talk a lot about, you know, the push to e for equity in schools. Mm -hmm. How is that impacting discipline? Like, what does it, first of all? And then if it does, how do you see that happening? Well, let's go, let's start with, and you and I know this, but I think it's worth repeating what, what they mean by equity. You know, um, I know that I've heard from administrators that equity just means giving kids equal opportunity, but we know that that's not what they mean. They mean that you're giving more resources and time and so forth to the, the less, um, uh, historically marginalized groups. Um, and and I, I think the way that if I wanted to conceptualize or verbalize that in, in what I see is um, there, there, there often is given um, more leeway to the kids that are the most worst behaved. Um, and, I, and I don't, let's, let's take out of it for on that note, um, like just straight up violence that gets them suspended. Right. Cause that's a different animal and that's, that's treated differently. But what we're talking about is the, the, the constant little things that, that build up over time and so forth and the, the overt defiance and disrespect and so forth. Um, it seems to be that the students that um, get a little bit more leeway because because teachers want to, they hope that if they don't discipline that kid, that maybe they'll figure out how to, you know, figure out how to behave at some point. 
So, you know, when, when I think of how equity is, is used in discipline, um, th to me, that's kind of how it, I see it playing out, whether it's right or wrong. That's, that's my, that's my vantage point on it. So you get the impression that, um, you know, if there is a, a let's say a, a problem student, a student who is just consistently rude, consistently disrespectful, disruptive, um, et cetera. And you get the feeling they're giving that, that, that person a lot of rope, like mm -hmm. they're not getting some kind of consequence for that behavior as right. quickly, perhaps as a student who is not from an historically marginalized group. Right. Well, and I think just in general, I mean, let me just let in me, general across the board. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, oh, let's pull okay. race out of it for right now and let's pull all those dynamics out and let's just say in, in my, in, you know, th and, and, and let me tell you that I, I feel that way sometimes myself, I feel myself giving um, some of the kids that have, you know, been, you know, um, needed more discipline. Sometimes I'll feel myself giving them a little bit more rope than, than other kids and, and so forth. So I definitely feel it's, it's, it's hard, you know, to be that consistent and so forth. Um, so I try to be somewhat patient with all my students because, you know, you got to pull back and remember that we're, I'm working with sixth and seventh graders. So mm -hmm. as, as you know, we try to separate out what's time tested, age appropriate, misbehaviors, right? Things that you and I might not want to talk about on this channel, like silly things that we did at that age um, versus behaviors that are new because of the system. Does that make sense? Okay. That well, let's talk about some examples. Um, so why don't you give us some examples that differentiate, for example, how I'll just tell you something I did when I was in middle school. I mentioned on the channel the other night, I we were we had a strict do not comb your hair in class policy. And I don't know why I was really defiant about it, but I kept trying to sneak combing my hair in class. It, I knew it was wrong <laughs> and I knew I wasn't supposed to do it, but I, I treated it almost like a game because I had decided that my way of fitting in socially at that point, because I'd been such a, you know, a, a nerd, a dud, a wallflower up until then, I was going to get attention from my peers by breaking rules without getting caught. Little rules, not big mm -hmm. rules, like when she wasn't looking at comb my hair and she wouldn't catch me. By the end of the year, she had a drawer full of my combs. <laughs> so it, it wasn't very successful. Um, but things like that, or I'd pass notes, you know, I just would be not really listening when I was supposed to listen. But I don't think I was, I didn't make a lot of noise or disrupt anybody. I just broke rules that were in mm -hmm. the class about little things like that. Yeah. That's what I did. I don't know about other people, but that was my breaking rules. Well, I don't really want to talk about some of the things that we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's so, an example. Like yeah. uh, what's, what, what's a typical thing that kids do today? So, okay. Let me, if let's, let me describe like some of the things that happened in my classroom and, and, and across the board, as I talked with other teachers and, and I've talked to a, uh, my, one of my best friends who still teaches at that Catholic school I left and they right. too are having issues. So, um, you know, there's a lot of physical, um, physical touching, if you will, slapping those type of things that are going on. Um, students uh, getting up to go walk around the room, even though that's what they're not supposed to do um, during certain times. I mean, there's appropriate times to get up and sharpen your pencil and stuff. Um, I'm getting to the point where I can't let students leave their desk area. Um, you know, again, for m the way I run my classroom, students can stand if they feel they need to stand because I'd rather have them standing than falling asleep, which is another problem that we're seeing. Um, but the issue is now is students, like let's say so-and-so goes walking across the room to sharpen their pencil and they'll smack a kid as they walk by, you know, and, oh, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, I don't smack my wife when I'm, you know, playful, you know. So so there's those things, a constant um, verbal shouts across the room for other kids to shut up. And then, of course, it becomes a shouting match back and forth. Um, you know, um, students just not even listening. They, they often will just have conversations and you can't even get their attention. Um, or, or once you get a couple kids' attention, the other ones chime in. And, you know, let's, uh, you know, one of the things I want to make sure is we pull back and, and traditionally you talk about 10% of the students are going to have some, some sort of behavioral issue. And in what you're trying to do with the behavioral system um, is try to grain in the 90%, keep them focused on task and then 10% you know, is, is give or take is, is a reasonable number. These misbehaviors right now that I'm seeing are well above that 10% range. 
Um, now the really, really bad it, it still sits in that range, but it, it, it certainly is, is a much bigger number of students that are just, I don't know if they just don't get enough social time at home or the last year and a half of COVID really, you know, hasn't allowed them to learn certain skills, which I don't know if I fully buy into. I mean, I don't know about you, but if, if an adult gets on me, I'm going to, you know, as a student, I'm going to, to kind of get refocused. And, and that's just not even, it's, it's becoming very difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers completely, but. So, okay. So I'm picturing what some people from the outside looking in might, might see as sort of a chaotic situation for a large percentage of the class period where mm -hmm. you're having to just to, to instruct, to teach, to lead, to guide, to do any of the things that teachers have to do to get some kind of instructional time in, um, or even to get the students to work on some kind of classwork mm -hmm. um you're having to deal with kids who are interacting with each other in ways that disrupt anybody's ability to do that right. yours right. the other students etc and so their their top priority seems to be interacting with each other in what appears to be unhealthy ways um healthy meaning you know like they're not asking so can i borrow your pencil or you know can i work with you on this it's more like screaming matches and touching people and all this and um and every effort you make to try to stop them is like does it does it do anything or does it just kind of like add fuel on the fire <laughs> it's like whack-a-mole because it i'll like bam 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 yeah, bam, like yeah. Oh. well because so you know it I wish I could say it was a beautiful chaos. You know, those classrooms where there is a designed kind of chaos where the kids are engaged. But if, if you were just a random passerby, you'd think things are up in the air. Um, and, and, and we're work, you know, we're trying to work on it. Um, but it's kind of like the needy kid over here, the helpless hand raiser who 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 needs you to come and, and pay them attention right away. And then, you know, the, the the boy that's over there and he's throwing stuff. And then there's a there's a girl over there who's you know, having a sidebar conversation with her buddies and, right. you know, and then the other boy over there who's on his laptop for the fifth time this class period playing a video game, even though you told him not to. And then, you know, then all of a sudden you get the pencil sharpener roaring. Um, and, and so you get all these pieces as you're trying to stay in the front of the room and trying to get them to take notes in their notebook and so forth. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's becomes to the point where you feel like you've only got maybe 10 minutes of actual instruction in a class period of 50 minutes. Um, right. I will tell you that one of the things we're, we're, we're working on this week, and this, this may sound silly to some people, but, um, just learning how to read silently because, you know, one of the things I think we forget about is that even my own children, they're plugged in all the time. I mean, my daughter, for example, she has her iPad and store, you know, an audio books going all the time to the point where we're now correcting her on it because it's just all, it's constant noise. And I think that that's one of the bigger issues outside of my classroom that um, I would advise parents to start becoming maybe a little bit more aware of is, does your child have actual silent time? And if not, what we're working, and I'll, I'll tie this into what we're doing in our classroom now is I'm starting to keep track of how many minutes my students can read actually silent without making noises locked in. And like yesterday, it was about three or four minutes before you know, because what happens is once noise gets created in the room or something happens, um, they all just lose focus right away. Of they can't, yeah. they can't, they can't lock it in. So, you know, when you, when you talk about all these disruptions and maybe I'm jumping a little bit, but, um, when you talk about all these, you know, you talk about all these disruptions, these kids can't cognitively focus on what's going on. And if they can't focus mentally, they're not getting the information they need. It's very, very bits and pieces. Um, and then we wonder why there's learning loss and so forth, you know? Right. Um, and so there it's, it's really frustrating. And there's been class periods where I'll just stand there and try to process how to best tackle this situation. And I'll, you know, so. Well, what I'm curious about is um, when you have students, you know, who are misbehaving in a way where it is really disrupting everybody else what, like, what would you like to do about it? And what are, would you feel like you're permitted to do about it? Are they the same or are they different? Well, I think one of the things in here, this is the hard part, and I'm going to not necessarily take my school off the hook a little bit, but the school I'm currently working at is only three years old. 
it was uh, developed in in 2017 2018 as is a kind of a pseudo charter magnet school uh it's by lottery um most of the lottery goes to the local community but then the whole district which is very wide um gets access to the remaining seats that are left over after that first draw um and so they in 2019 was their first year open and then of course in the in that spring everything got shut down. And then last year it was piecemeal where kids, you know, barely in the school and stuff. So this is actually the first year that they've actually been full time in the building since the fall of 2019. And it's the first year that they've had all three grade levels in there. Cause when they first started, they only had sixth grade. So, you know, somebody that's built a program and a culture, they're still put it, trying to figure out what pieces they need to put into place. But what I will tell you what I want to do or I would prefer to do, um, which is in the talks, is a little bit more of a PBIS approach, which we had used at the at a middle school before when I worked, which is, you know, um, trying to reward those kids that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, okay. So in other words, if you're sitting at your desk and you're doing the, the bell ringer or bell work that you're supposed to be doing and I walk around and I and I, you know, randomly will, will give you a reward, things like that. And that's, again, to tackle the 90 percent because you're still going to have those other kids that are not. Um, you know, how do you tackle those other kids that are not doing it? Well, you know, you might you might need to give them a little bit more attention to get them to comply, hold them after class, call their parents or email their parents, uh, those type of things. Um, and then the biggest thing here is I, I'm big on steps, right? So the... I believe very much in what my, my dad had implemented at the, at the public high school that he taught at the, the high school and so forth that they used a step program, you know, and it's not perfect for everybody, but it, you know, at least with it, from a teacher's perspective, you kind of knew where the line was, right. Mm -hmm. That you knew, okay, this kid is doing this, this many times. So let's, let's find what's going to stop the behavior. Right. That's the, that's the biggest thing, right? We want to stop the behavior and we want to, correct it with the right behaviors. Um, and, and we don't have that in place. And I wonder how many schools have that in place, you know, um, and so forth. Um, your camera just went out. I know it did it to me, didn't it? <laughs> I was like, what, where'd he go? <laughs> no Shoot. signal. Yeah. Give me one second. Okay. I apologize. That's all right. That's all right. Sorry, folks. Please excuse our here. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what. Give it a second. It'll reboot. Okay. That's what I was when you use an old camera, right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry um, about that. No, that's so. all right. But so, okay. It, it seems like they're, they're a little bit of a work in progress, just getting the school up and running. And if you think about a sixth grader this year, their last full normal year of school might've been fourth grade. Right. And so, you know, if you talk about being in a room, full of people if your last experience was fourth grade and now you're in middle school so that's a big jump i think i mean mm -hmm. i think because i remember at the end of fifth grade for my kids when they were in public school they at least did a whole transition thing where they'd go over and spend a day and like right. walk around and and kind of learn the ropes um that it's more would be expected of them because when you're in elementary school you're in one room you have one teacher and you're one room most of the day you might go to the library or resource center whatever they call it you might go to the pe class you might go to recess something like that but for the most part most students spend most of their day in a single room with a single teacher you go to middle school and it's a whole new world. Now you're responsible to get yourself through the hallway to different classrooms, to different teachers, right? right? To different subjects. And so in addition to navigating um, a, a process where you are reading to learn as opposed to learning to read at a much, I would think it's a higher level than what elementary school has or supposed to be. You have to navigate the different personalities of different teachers, the different standards, the different classroom rules, even just different subject matter areas and what they entail and that you know for those watching you know put yourself in the in the headspace of the kid okay that that's a lot of different executive function skills to master just for the work and now add the self-discipline that has to come with that where i'm going to walk through hallways multiple times a day on my own without not in a little line where the teacher's at the front leading us all in the same direction like you know 
that I did in elementary school, but I have to get myself from point A to point B within a pre prescribed time. Otherwise I'm late and I'm disruptive and all these things. And then when I get there, I have to immediately adjust to not moving anymore, sitting mm -hmm. still, paying attention, listening. So best circumstances, like kids who have, you know, rock solid home lives. Um, you know, they, they, they kind of knew what to expect. They came in and, you know, it's, it's 20 years ago and, and you know, we have, you know, the best case scenario, it's still very challenging. Right. And we, we, we always joke. I mean, it, when I was a teacher and I'm sure for you that middle school is like this three years of particularly hellish existence for teachers and students because of all the hormones that are raging too on top of it. So best case scenario, you have a challenging environment for students and for teachers. Am I describing it accurately? Oh, Developmentally, yeah. they're yeah. going through a lot. There's a lot going on. Well, what I'm curious about, because I've been following the changes, not only to curriculum, but to expectations on the side of, of um, discipline, is I'm kind of curious, what are the, the takeaways that students are getting from the new world, the new processes, the new expectations, whatever? What, what, are, what do you think they're learning um, from that? you know, what's the good that they're learning and what's the maybe not so good that they're learning. I think the, the things that they're learning that, um, concern me is well, certain things are not acceptable, right? I mean, kids are, kids are going to say stupid things. They're going to, they're going to get angry. They might throw a temper tantrum or cry, things like that. Right. We, we get that part and so forth. Sure. Um, but one of the things that I see that that really bothers me that I, I'm worried that they're learning is OK is is the constant slapping and hitting of each other. And I say that because if if the teachers across the board in the entire building are not consistent through and through. So you and I are teachers. And if we're not hammering the kids on the same exact things, what they're learning how to do is play mom versus dad. And it's actually happened to me a number of times. In fact, they they use the principal or the assistant principal to say, well, so-and-so said this. Well, did they really? Well, no, but she didn't say anything. And so what they're doing is some of them are learning to manipulate because, again, if the if the teachers are not consistent across, and they're not, you know, we, we as a team are not consistent. And, and that's, I've been in, in a lot of buildings I've been at that's been the same problems where you know they'll they'll learn that if you go down this hallway this teacher is going to say something so fix your shirt and put on your ID etc but all these other teachers you can wear whatever you want you can you can play on your phone etc so you know i think if if i said that the kids especially the older they get they're they're getting better at this is they they're learning how to manipulate and they're learning how to um, you know navigate those waters um, mm -hmm. of getting around the rules as opposed to, you know, everybody being consistent and, 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 um, you know, taking care of business that way. So, right. um, well, they also are using one of the things I've noticed is that, for example, anti-bullying rules or the anti-bullying campaigns that came into schools after Columbine almost forced tri triangulation with adults where, you know, two kids might have a dispute and, you know, we tell them like, oh, come to the adult, go to the adult. So rather than learning how to either just put up with a certain amount of BS because kids are just obnoxious, okay, and just go ignore it, go on your merry way, or deal with that person head, you know, face to face in a constructive way, mm -hmm. like, hey, stop touching me or stop, you know, messing with my hair or stop messing with my stuff and, and trying to resolve it themselves first. I mean, you may not be successful, but at least attempting it. Right. Right. We see, and I've seen video footage of this of kids, like the one kid does the smallest thing. They look at someone cross-eyed teacher, they do the, blah, 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 blah. you know, and I, when I was volunteer teaching in a middle school, they would do that a lot, you know, that I wouldn't see something happening in their side of the room. And I'd get this, like they did this and I would turn and the other person, of course, deny it. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And there'd be this, like he said, she said, I didn't see it. And they're like forcing me to make a decision. And so many times I would have to say, look, guys, are, are you hurt? Are you hurt? Is everything okay? Can you get back to do, doing what you're doing right now? Are, are we good? Because I didn't see it. 
I wasn't there and I, I, I can't choose sides here. I'm not doing mm -hmm. that. So why don't you just not talk to each other for a little bit and just you do your work and you do your work and, and they'd get really angry because they'd be like, you know, that's not fair. You need to make a decision. I'm like, no, actually I don't, but they expected me to, they would expect me to resolve like all their little disputes and issues. And if there are teachers who will do that, like, oh, let's all sit down and have a little confab, you know, then the kid to me would learn, like, I need adults involved in all my problems. Right. right. Yep. And, and the other thing, too, that's going along with that is, um, you know, actually, the word the word of the week is snitch. So that's what I'm dealing with at the middle schools is they'll they'll call each other snitches. But then they'll do that, too. What you just said, where they'll, okay. you know, did you see this? Did you see this? Because, you know, um, one of the let me let me drop a positive on one of the things that school is trying to do that that I, I think has its place. Okay. And, and and they are trying to meet, you know, teach kids to to mediate these things and so forth. And, and the, you know, the school counselor or the assistant principal, et cetera, or social worker that we have in our building. And they're they're really good. Um, and they'll bring the students in and they'll have them sit down. And they'll talk through. I think there's definitely things that happen where that's maybe maybe not right away needs to happen where discipline needs to be meted out, et cetera. But um, when it's little little things that are that are bothersome for the kids, they they are trying to do that. And I think that that's fair. I think that that's an adult like thing. Um, although I do think back uh, to my younger days and, um, you know, for some kids, that's just not going to work. They're going to go through the motions and so forth and move on. But right. but but definitely that those games are being played in the classroom all the time and stuff. So right. it's 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 a hard it's a hard thing to navigate. You know, it's um, you've really got to have yourself disciplined to be consistent um, I think the best the best um, compliment I ever got as a coach was from a parent that said I was an equal opportunity butt chewer, that it didn't <laughs> it didn't matter which kid was doing. I would call out any any of my athletes or students for misbehavior. I, I try I try very hard not to you know pick favorites in that regard and try to be consistent. And and again, we're none of us are perfect, but that's my goal is to be as consistent as possible with that. Now, how are your so because they are not consistent. How do your students respond to you when you try to use uh, more traditional methods of discipline or when you have high expectations of their behavior? If let's say their other teachers don't, um, do the kids push back on you? Do they leverage that and be like, well, so-and-so does the different or, I mean, does that mm -hmm. happen? Oh, that happened. I think just last week they said, well, so-and-so doesn't do this. I said, well, I'm not them. Um, I kind of pulled their stuff uh, back on them. But what we established from the get go is that in this classroom, these are the things, this is how we operate and so forth. And they still try to do it because they're kids. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I believe, and I've seen this now here's the hard part is that, you know, we're still technically kind of, we're still in the first half of the school year. So this stuff takes time and so forth. Um, but establishing those norms and when they walk in that room, at least they know what they're getting. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the most damaging thing for a kid is when they walk into a classroom and they don't know which teacher they're getting that day because they have a Jekyll and Hyde teacher who if they're, you know, what, what often happens. And I, I think we're all guilty of this. Right. Where you tolerate certain behaviors, you tolerate behaviors, you tolerate it, you tolerate it. And then you finally have just had enough and you just blow up. Right. Instead of nipping that behavior in the butt early on, right? You know, the kind of the dragon's um, uh, story where it's a little tiny dragon and you stop the little tiny dragon from getting bigger um, mm -hmm. because if it gets too big, then it's, it's hard to, to, to fight off. Right. And, and, and so, you know, that's where I think teachers have a lot of room to grow to, in order to, um, uh, you know, in general with the discipline stuff is, you know, well, I don't want to pick those battles. No, you got to pick every battle because if you do it early on, it's it's cumbersome and, and it's tiring, but it makes your life so much easier later on. Sort of like a broken window, uh, like um, approach to policing the classroom, if you will. Where, you know, as soon as they break break that first window, you're like, no, we're not letting mm -hmm. this escalate to breaking and entering. You know, yeah. um, but do you feel like they're that students today have picked up on any of the culture war stuff, the rhetoric that's been going around, um, where people on social media will use words to bully other people by claiming they're being 
but do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like, you're a, you're a misogynist. Well, no, you're the racist. Well, you're the, is that happening in, in school? Is that happening in your classes? Mm-hmm. I had a sixth grade girl use that on a fifth, on a sixth grade boy. She called him a misogynist just because he was mildly misbehaving. Um, I do hear the term racist being thrown out at other students to basically just use to silence them. Um, cause apparently the word shut up doesn't work. So I'm just going to throw that out. But that was that the misogynist thing was like one time, one okay. time I haven't heard that since, but, okay. but, but students are, they, they are picking up on that stuff. Um, you know, obviously we saw, um, cause we, we had spread it out on, on Twitter that, you know, back in September of uh, the TikTok video stuff with the schools and, and so forth. And, and that actually was happening at our school too, with the bathroom stuff and, and, you know, and they, and our, you know, kudos to our district. Um, and our administration, they were on it as soon as it came out that that stuff was happening. They were on our students and they started, you know, patrolling the bathrooms more and, and so on and so forth. These are the TikTok challenges where we're going to yep. damage school property, put it on TikTok. Mm-hmm. It'll be famous, that yep. kind of thing. Yep. Okay. So, so, you know, credit to them that they were on that right away. They already started teaching the kids, you know, why would you, why would you damage your space? Th- these things right. are for you. And so, so they did, they did try to turn it into a teaching thing, but yeah, the, the students are, are very much um, picking up on, on some of the social media stuff and, and, and behaviors. And, and, and I don't have this for, you know, now information for fact, but makes me wonder with all the, let's say me mid-level violence that we're seeing. And what I mean by mid-level violence is, you know, that playful smacking and hitting and pushing and stuff like that. Um, that they see that somewhere and they see that as acceptable and it could be at home. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know that, that information, um, right. but, but they're bringing it into school and it's not stopping is, is kind of my frustration with it. And so. what are, are you, are, so I'm, I assume you have a policy in your classroom where like you can't touch other people. Like you just don't lay hands on other people for even playfully. You just don't do it. It just saves a lot of headaches later. I would imagine. Right. Yeah. Um, but now if you have a student who just insists on continuing to do it or other, or do they talk back to you? So in other words, if you set a rule and you said, look, we're not doing this, this is not allowed in this classroom. Do they give you grief over it? Or do they just mutter under the breath? Like wh- wh- how much pushback are you getting and how egregious is it? Verbal pushback. I'd say the, the, the kids that are, let's, let's say, you know, touching or hitting each other, so, you know, mild mid-level assault, if you will, or whatever, whatever term you want to use. They're usually the ones that will mouth back or they'll go, what I do, or I didn't do nothing. And, and, and what's, it's kind of funny in a way because you're like, I just watched you hit that kid, you know? And I, and I, I can't tell you if they actually think that that's okay. Like I, I honestly, you know, I've asked them before and they'll tell you, well, no, it's not. So why'd you do it? I don't know. You know what? I don't understand. So, um, yeah, they'll, they'll mouth off. They'll, you know, um, they'll back talk for sure. Back talk is a normal thing. Um, I've had, um, one of the things I tell my students is I don't, I don't argue with 11 and 12 year olds. I don't argue with you. And yet they want to still try to argue with me and, and so forth. But, um, I have, you know, definitely, I mean, I would say that everybody in the building has kind of that policy. The problem is we're, we're having an issue with getting them to stop doing it. And so they're just really persistently low level violent. Like mm-hmm. they're just there's because because that actually is new since I last set foot in a middle school classroom, which was now th- going on three years. And um, I did I might have seen like one student do that. And it would be like, you know, the predictable one student that just had that. That was his thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it was usually a boy. Um I didn't see the girls do that that much. They did other things. Like they would like shove each other in the hallway. They'd kind of do this leaning thing. They would touch each other's hair, or like put their hands all up in their hair. They did things like that, but they didn't, once they came into the classroom, they usually, uh, their biggest problem is they were really squirmy. They couldn't sit still. Like mm-hmm. you were describing, they couldn't sit still. They couldn't handle silence. Um, they didn't, they talked over each other, just getting them to, you know, s- stop making sounds <laughs> mm, <laughs> while right. someone else is trying to speak like the teacher or another student or whatever. So most, most of what I had to deal with the last time I was in a middle school classroom when it was sixth and seventh grade were kids who lacked self-control when it came to just 
making themselves known verbally, mm -hmm. but it sounds like that has escalated to making themselves known physically. Like well, they've and, kind of it, gone up a notch. So the, my first teaching job was in 2008, 2009 at the middle school. And, and, and I'll tell you that the middle schoolers are a, a bit more touchy feely, right? I mean, I, we had, you know, kids hitting each other and doing things like that and so forth. Uh, the, the, like I said, that low level stuff. Um, it's, it's the scale now that I see with the, with the, the students I work with now and, and so forth. The, just the, the sheer, it's almost like every kid is somehow or another kind of, you know, smacking each other, especially, especially during the passing periods. Um, and I think you brought up a good point earlier where these kids, you know, especially the sixth graders, they've never been in a school where they change classes like this, you know. And that's the other thing, too, is, you know, their middle, you know, elementary school kids, they may have only had one teacher. So they they had one teacher all year minus, let's say, their, their specials, right, their PE, their art, whatever else. Right. And so there was a consistency with them, with that mm -hmm. teacher, whatever that consistency was. And now they're, they're learning how to navigate different teachers that do different things. And, you know, we have a very heavy male population in our building of teachers. Very that's heavy. Good, I would think. You know, we're at least 50, 50, if not more okay. yeah. for middle school. That's excellent. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so I think some of these students may have never in their life had a male teacher. So um, there are some things that they're navigating there too. Nothing against female teachers at all, but I've had some students where that is a bit of a culture shock for them to be dealing with a male teacher and so forth. Um, tell me, tell me more about that. Um, because my audience might be thinking, why did she react so positively immediately? And I was like, Oh, that's really good. They're 50, 50 male, female. And, but I'm not going to answer it. I'm curious what your answer is as far as the distribution of gender is for right. on amongst the teachers and specifically in middle school. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's yeah. a balance to the force. Um, you know, you, you have, a, um, you know, I mean, that's the, you know, that's why, you know, um, marriage works. If, you know, if you have that, that balance and a discipline, no matter what the couple is, if you have a good balance to the, to the family, you know, to the marriage and stuff, um, when raising kids. And, um, my opinion is with, with having a balance of female and male teachers, you, you get a good variety of perspectives on things and, and, and so forth. And you, you get, you know, there, there's a, a bit of that loving, you know, that motherly type, but then you get that father a bit stern. And sometimes, by the way, that doesn't mean that the, the female is not stern. I've met some very tough, I mean, my best friend's a very tough disciplined teacher um, and so forth. But it's just a, a different presence. You know, I'm, I'm six foot two and 200 pounds and I'm athletic, right? And so, you know, that, that brings a, just me being around sometimes will just kind of, you know, kind of calm things down a little bit and so forth. And, and, you know, it's, it's a presence. And, and like I said, it doesn't apply to everybody, you know, and we have another teacher, male teacher, who's a former Marine. So he's, you know, and he's six foot five, six foot six. So he's a big physical dude too. And, and he worked, spent some time working in the prisons, teaching in the prisons. So he brings that bit of a perspective too and stuff. But um, I would say, oh, you know, just in general, it's just a, a another presence that's different. Um, mm -hmm. That that can also help bring a little bit more of a male perspective to to especially our young males, because I have a great concern about um, I have a great concern about all my students, but but I'm really concerned about the direction a lot of our young men are going. So, um, but but anyway, can you, can you explain that a little bit? I'm curious. Um, we, schools schools about. are uh, schools are not conducive to a young male focus in terms of how they've traditionally operated. I mean, you know, tell a young male to sit in a chair and, you know, sit there all day, um, especially if they're not necessarily academic focused per se, mm -hmm. um, or they're not big readers. Um, you know, and that's one of the things we, we struggle with is we've got a lot of kids that can't literally can't read. So what else are they going to do? Um, and, and so forth. But, um, the males are falling behind. Um, they, I mean, you look at there's somebody just posted the other day, some data online. It wasn't necessarily fully related to the school, but you know, females are, you know, overtaking males. I mean, now 60% of, of students in a university level are female. You know, yeah. the majority of the degrees are going to females. Now, maybe that means males are going off in the trades and that'd be fantastic too. You know, I, I'm not saying I know why these things are happening and, and, and so forth. And it could right. be choices. But yeah. the, the young males, you know, they're um, 
I think they're more nihilistic too. Um, I had a student last week tell me that, you know, everybody dies at some point. So why should he care about doing schoolwork? And that just about broke my heart because here's a 12 year old that is already nihilistic. Um, wow. And that's, you know, and, and, and so a lot of our young males um, I've taught in the past, I've taught young males with that same similar perspective that their dad was a gangbanger and he died at 21. So what the heck does he care? You know, so you know, you talk about that male, that male presence too in the building. And that's part of it is that we can, you know, maybe try to un get in their head and understand a little bit and, and maybe bring a, a strong male influence that way. But right. um, are you seeing more fights like actual, we were talking about this low level assault, but what about straight up fist fights? Are they happening more? And are you seeing anything different this year than you've seen in the past? in school as far as that goes a little hard for me just because you know i've been away from the school setting for a couple of years and so forth um so a little bit hard to judge um i guess i'll try to pick, compare middle school to middle school okay. um i think we've already had more in-house fights than we had in the past um and, and i'm going to tell you the majority of them right now have been females that's it's what not, i was i that was yeah. my hunch Yep. And I was wondering if that was true. Okay. So keep, and, keep yeah. Going. Yeah. So it's, you know, the most of our fights have been between females. Um, they have been, a couple of them have been egged on by males who want to see them fight because what they want to do is they want to film it and post it to social media so they can get the likes and the clicks. And so we've got kind of like an underground UFC thing going on um, with these kids where they, they see that as their way to become famous because a lot of them, um, have one way or another learned that they're going to become a TikTok star, you know, and, and so forth. And that's, and that's one of the ways they see about going about doing it because let's face it, you know, uh, libs on TikTok has been doing a fantastic job of posting those videos. Well, guess what happens? Those videos go viral and, and, and so forth. So, so right. yes, the moment see that, yeah, I mean, I mean, I've had wrestling female. So you took, let's go back to the low level violence piece. So it starts off with this is that, you know, two friends sometimes are just kind of smacking each other and, and we're just playing. And all of a sudden one takes it too far. And before you know it, they're, they're literally in my classroom at a wrestling match. And you're just like, stop, stop, stop. But you don't want to get in the middle of it because if they harm you as a teacher, you know, you potentially could press charges. And so that's the other hang up with the teachers. Like, you know how people say, well, why did a teacher intervene? Yeah. Um, if it's not getting out of hand, like if out of hand. Um, yeah, right. right. Our definition right. of out of hand, it seems to be changing rapidly. I know. I'm I know. seeing some of these videos and I'm like, that's out of hand. But then I guess maybe it's not. I, I don't know. If, yeah, it, I guess let me be more uh, clear. If I feel like a student is really going to be in, in like way physical harm's way, then I'm definitely stepping in. Most of the time I, I do, um, but I have to be very careful about doing it, if that makes sense. And, and, if, and well, also it, you're probably inhibited, like you don't want to touch the wrong part of their body. Right. Like they're right. moving and they're doing the thing and you get between them and God forbid your hand goes in the wrong place. Suddenly it's like you were in on it doing something, whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. not to be gross, but you know what I'm saying? Like right. we, when I was first teaching, they told us we weren't allowed to hug the kids. Like we weren't allowed to help. I was teaching first grade in my first year. And they said, if a kid has an accident, you can't help them. Mm -hmm. Now I wouldn't have really wanted to help that much, but like, I would have wanted to like hand them something or, you know, like try to like, you know, a little bit help them, even if I wasn't like touching them and like, no, you can't even do that. You can't be, have any part of you in the bathroom where they are. Mm -hmm. Like they have to go in there alone and deal with it. And I used to feel so bad. You'd have these little like six and seven year old kids and they're just on their own in the most, on the most embarrassing day of their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but they were so clear because of all of that panic about the daycare people. Right. And it was just, you can, don't touch them. Don't hug them. Don't, you know, don't hold their hand. Don't do anything. And it just felt so awkward to me that you, can, you, you couldn't do that. And then when it came to fighting, it was kind of the same story. But I remember being in fourth grade and kids fighting. And my fourth grade teacher, Miss Audino, she was kind of a badass, just got right smack in the middle of it, was like, stop! You know, like she just like mm -hmm. put her hands and shoved these two boys, like kind of grabbed their shirt collars. It was like, no more, right? And it ended. 
that that was it. It was over. Um, and they both had to go to the principal's office and that was the end of that. And I think everybody else in the class was sort of chastened. We were like, okay, well, I'm never going to let that happen to me, you know, because she absolutely took control of this situation physically. Like she didn't hit anybody, but she just physically grabbed their shirts and was like, no more. Right. And whereas I don't think that would ever happen today. I don't think the teachers would do that. No. I mean, you might get away with it a little bit more with the private schools, depending on how they operate and stuff. But right. I, what what happens to, you know, the thing that goes through a teacher's mind in that scenario is one, I mean, I, I worked with a, she was a long-term sub at the, at the former military uh, m- middle school and she got knocked unconscious. She got a concussion from a yeah, student because she right. tried to step in and, and, and get into, and this was middle school again. Um, the other thing is, is that whether or not you hurt that child, who's to say that parent's not going to come in and come after you? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And, and they're going to try to try to charge you with some sort of assault or something like that for stopping a fight. And, you know, we live in, in clown world anyway. So, um, you know, it's, it's people are just looking for those things to, to go after parents for or teachers for. So, right. So um, those, those watching, if anybody ever says to you again, like, why don't the teachers break up the fights? Why are the teachers, you know, I've, I've seen people say, oh, those teachers are so beta, whatever. Like, well, you've just heard the reason. You could lose a yeah. tooth. You could lose an eye. You could go get knocked unconscious. Um, they pick up a desk and hit you over the head. You could die. So, I mean, they're, these are pretty serious situations. Middle school kids can be pretty big. Yeah. And, um, you know, it might not be as big a deal to you, but like I'm 5'2". So if I were in that classroom, I, I wouldn't at this point. I wouldn't get involved because I wouldn't want to be hurt. It's not worth it. And like you said, if I tried to intervene and then I accidentally – you know, or somebody could claim I accidentally hurt somebody, then they sue me. So right. it, it's a mess. Um, and are you seeing like, what would you say is the frequency of these girl fights? Is it like once a week or I mean, mm-hmm. like roughly the obviously. real the, like, well, let, let's say like legitimate all out fights. We may have only had a couple so far this year. I mean, oh, we okay. got the little squabbles and stuff like something that happened okay. in my room, my room recently where. They, you know, like I said, it turned into a small wrestling match and it was kind of like, no, stop, no, stop, no, stop. And then they finally stopped and they go off and they deal with it with the assistant principal type of thing. But didn't you, you have know, a situation where they knocked a wall over? Yeah, that was that I think one. You wrote, yeah. Oh, that was well, that one. They... Well, because I have a dev- I have a movable wall between my neighbor teacher and I. Um, so if we wanted to do joint stuff together or open up to one big room, we could do that. And so they kind of okay. went pushing through that. But um you know, and let me be, I mean, I want to be very clear that if I feel like students are in legitimate danger, you know, I'm going to be stepping in, you know, come hell or high water. And there goes my camera again. I don't know what to <laughs> okay. do. I don't, I apologize. This thing That's is so okay. Bad. Old school camera, old school problems. Yeah, there I am. I should be back in a second. So, okay. so, um, you know, that's uh, the joys of technology these days, you know? Yeah. Us teachers are not, you know, we're not, we're not rolling in the dough. So we got to. Yeah, Jimmy, exactly. Jimmy, what we got lying around. So it's you either... should go if you did DEI or you know SEL, maybe you would. Now well, that don't get me, me started. To... <laughs> yeah, well, that brings me to another thing. We've heard a lot, of course, about SEL and how they're using it to almost you know like do therapy in the school and so forth. They're doing restorative justice, which a lot of people don't understand. And the problem I have, and and tell me if this is something that you grapple with, is that these things can be good. Like in other mm-hmm. words. Students, as we've just described, do need to be taught conflict resolution skills. You're not born knowing these things. They do need to learn how to manage their emotions. And if they do come from homes where that's they're not seeing that modeled, then it's appropriate for teachers or possibly the school counselor or somebody when they identify that kids are struggling with this issue to, and possibly even across the board to have some like general, like, you know, high level standard discussions about emotional management. But what I think we've seen happen is this has gone from something that was good that helped kids work through these things um, in a constructive way to um, like, it's in every classroom, it's in all kinds of subject areas. And it's, it, it feels like it's shifted from the individual person learning to manage their individual emotions and their individual behavior to a kind of like, this is how we all fight for social justice. You know, like it's gone right. to this complete, like more global thing. And I worry that it's teaching kids how to make excuses 
It's teaching kids how to have crutches and how to play victim. So mm -hmm. in a situation where they otherwise might be disciplined, they now have vocabulary to talk about their trauma, their triggering, their microaggressions, and these different things. Whereas before it was like, no, you're responsible for you, but we're going to teach you some skills so you can do that better. Now it's kind of like, well, it might not be your fault because they triggered you. Or they triggered right. your trauma and this kind of stuff. Do it, Am I imagining it or do you think that is a danger? Oh, I think it's definitely a danger. And I think, um, you know, I will, I will speak for my school because we have our structure is a little different than most schools. So let, let's say that a, a normal school has some sort of homeroom period, right? We have a kind of a, we call it our base camp, but we have a homeroom period that starts the day. And it's about 20, 20 minutes as the kids filter in and get themselves going. And if they, they need to eat breakfast, they do that. And, you know, we, we teach them some things that I agree with. Um, you know, like we talked about earlier about that kind of that, that time of learning to be silent. Yeah. So we have, we have a, a medit like meditation, we call it headspace, just a, a, a kind of a, a sequence where they, for five minutes, we're just going to kind of control our breathing. Um, and and in, in my base camp, I teach them the same skills I taught my, my collegiate athletes about the breathing exercises and why they're important, right? That when you get Let's say you're even if you're going to take a test, if you learn how to control your breathing, it calms you down and relaxes you. So we practice it helps those reduces things. cortisol and releases yep. dopamine in your brain. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the other thing that you know we've been doing is is what you and I would know better from back in my early days of teaching, just called character education. Yeah. Because that's what SCL started off as was just straight up characterization or character education. And the difference was, is that you were teaching a lot more personal responsibility for your actions and your behaviors, right? Even, even yes. deer, deer and the anti-bullying stuff was far more geared towards personal responsibility of not doing these things. And now what we're starting to see, especially with not just SEL, but what parents need to be aware of is the transformative SEL, mm. which is the one that's really, you know, really laced with, with, you know, critical race theory praxis is is the application of of this stuff in there and transformative is you know there's a couple leading gurus on this side of things that you know um normal this is a liter almost literally a quote from one of them which is um sel is whiteness with a hug you know and wow. um and and so what they're trying to do is they're trying to take s just so social emotional learning to the next level of, of this stuff. So, you know, parents want to be looking out for transformative SEL. What are they trying to transform it into? Or what are they trying to trans? How are they trying to transform the kid? What's the transformation aimed at? A lot more critical social justice. So they want to transform like power structures mm -hmm. using SEL. Yep. yep. That, that Systemic like oppression. Fancy, yeah. That sounds like a fancy way of saying, let's, um, let's tell the kids like I said, let's give them potentially excuses for bullying, like for, you know, for so taking back power from the, what they perceive to be vested in other people based on race or based on some other characteristic, you know, gender, for example. And that's what concerns me. They took something good. Mm -hmm. They took something that had the potential. I still don't think it should be like, you know, constant, you know, you still need to focus on academics, but I think it can be when, when applied judiciously by people who are trained properly, um, you know, and not beat the kids over the head with it, because tell me if you've seen this kids, especially at this age, they, they start getting, they, they start getting cynical about things that we do too much. Mm -hmm. So they like loses its value. Like, Oh, here we go again. Right. Whereas if you do it, it like targeted and specific times, like I said, the breathing exercise and like, now let's move on. Or you, you wait for there to be an issue and you address it. They tend to be more resp responsive when it becomes this thing where you're almost like assuming they need it all the time. Kids go deaf. They're just mm -hmm. like, Oh, here we go again. You're going to talk to me about my feelings or whatever. So the plus side of that attitude is that when they're doing the transformative stuff, we, you know, society might benefit because the kids might tune it out which would be a good outcome because it's, some of it needs to be tuned out. Mm -hmm. But the downside is the character stuff isn't going to get taught. They're, right. they're not going to learn the upside of SEL. And then restorative justice was another one that started off, yeah. I think, as a good thing to help keep the kids, first of all, in school. 
you know, right. so like we get to them before things escalate, before things get out of hand, we work on, we take some of the SEL skills, but now we apply it to the conflict resolution in a much more focused way. And we work on discipline inside the school. So we're not constantly suspending kids and we're right. not, you know, feeding that, that, that made a lot of sense. And when done well, it actually is really good. What I'm seeing now, though, is that what they're calling restorative practice or restorative praxis feels a lot like group therapy. It, it looks mm -hmm. a lot with these circles and then circles around the circles and a tier pyramid of circles to the point where, you know, they don't even seem to acknowledge in their little videos that if the if the preempt it, like if the stuff you're doing to preempt the conflict, because they have a big section of we're going to do all these circles to preempt conflict. And they're like, and then when things get up to the, and I'm like, why did they get there? Why, why do you need a whole separate? I mean, not that it shouldn't exist at all, but it's like, and then we move to this. And I'm like, well, if you spend this much time doing the preventative and you, it just seemed to me contradictory. And what I started to realize is if you dig, if you keep digging, you're going to get a hole or you pick a scab, you're going to, it's going to bleed. And that's what I, I've started feeling like these restorative practices practices are teaching kids to like find problems where they aren't mm -hmm. in order to have something to participate in or talk about or be the center. Like let's center this person on this discussion. And it becomes a kind of, uh, social currency to have a problem. Right. Well, it's kind of like the, you know, our, remember our days of the dare dare program. And if you, if you're like me, you sat there and go, well, yeah, no, duh, I don't want to do drugs. I don't right? have an interest. However, I did have classmates who learned a lot about what drugs they should and shouldn't be doing in a negative way. And right. I think that that's in the same thing with anti-bullying campaigns. You're almost like you're giving bullies more ideas or different ways to exactly. think about how they can bully. And so while anti-bullying will, will work very well with the kids that aren't prone to bullying, I, I think that there's that, let, let's even say, use that 10% number, that 10% population is going to learn how to leverage that information. You know, yeah. I felt the same way with some um, sexual abuse training I had to go through as a teacher, you know, where I had to watch these videos and I'm just sitting there going, you know, a person that wants to carry out these things, watches these things and figures out ways to actually do it. Right. right? right. Um, and I think the same thing with the SL, SEL stuff. If I were a student and I was prone to misbehave and, and I was bored at school and whatever else, and I didn't really care, I would love to have restorative justice because it'd be like, I'm going to go in, I'm going to say these five things. They're going to say, okay. And then I'm going to move on with my life and I get to go back to doing what I'm doing. And then I get in trouble again, as long as I don't cross that line that gets me suspended. Mm -hmm. All they're yeah. going to do is they're going to take me out of class and I'm going to sit and I'm going to talk about my feelings and I'm going to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then go back to class. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a, a real consequence. And as much as I, I value the idea of keeping kids in school and not having them end up suspended, mm -hmm. whatever, sometimes you got to hit rock bottom in order to understand there, the consequences have a role too. So I think I want to show you this from ego brain it says that that is my son's school. We're talking about the SEL being like almost the yeah, SEL and restorative justice being like in your face all the time, right? Yeah. Um, constant web mails about it. He gets more stuff from counselors on SEL than mails from his actual teachers about school subjects. And then I said something about it and they just stopped sending the emails to me, but still send them to him. <laughs> so they're still sending them to the kid. And I mean, think about the message, the lesson the kid is learning too is, well, let's see, I get 50% more info about my feels than I do about my academic work. Yep. So, you know, I, I would imagine if I'm a kid, I'm going to sit there and go, okay, I'm getting a D my feels. Yep. And now maybe my D they go to talk to my teacher about, you know, can, do you really have to fail this kid? And, da, da, da. and I mean, have you had a situation where you felt like you needed to give a kid an appropriate grade? Like they didn't earn a grade that mm -hmm. was you know, they didn't do the work or whatever. They failed something. They got a low grade and they responded with like my feels, my feels, my feels, or did they take it and say, okay, I, I guess I got to work harder. I just had a number of kids blame me for their, their F. They, they weren't, they weren't, rem they were concerned about their grade, but their reaction wasn't what do I need to do right now to fix this? 
it was, well, you did this and you did this. And, and, and actually, you know, one student literally blamed me for her failing grade um, and so forth. And I won't get into that too much, but you know, it's, it's um, kids will do that. Right. I mean, I'm not, uh, it wasn't fully surprising that I was getting blamed, but the number of students blaming me for their failing grade. And, and it really it was, they, they made a choice. They had in class time to do this assignment and either they didn't really work on it or they pretend to work on it, whatever it was. Um, they didn't turn it in. And it could have been that simple. They just didn't turn it in properly, which, you know, I, I'm one of those teachers where it's like you can turn it in and you'll get credit for it, especially if it's done right and everything. Uh, no problem. Um, but instead of problem solving, they just went right to the blame and play victim card. Um, now, again, we're talking about middle schoolers. So we're going to be a little bit more patient on this one than if it were a high school kid. Right. right. Um, and, and, but at and the same time, they have to we have to gradually work them into the idea of personal responsibility sure. they will be a high school kid who does it and right and i guess my concern is with the focus on you know sel and equity and all the social justice stuff if the if the message they're taking away is not no matter what happens i'm personally responsible for my reaction i'm responsible for my feelings i'm about it etc and by the way feelings aren't facts so if that's not part of the message, if the, if the message is let's get in touch with our feelings, let's explore our feelings, let's share our feelings, let's talk about how our feelings shouldn't be hurt and other people shouldn't hurt our feelings. It, you know, especially kids at that age, um, I think sometimes adults who craft these programs either don't remember, don't care, or they know perfectly well and they don't care um, that kids don't reason the way adults do. Right. So they don't make that leap from, you know, I got an F and I feel like crap about the F. Okay, what am I going to do about it? They sit here like, I feel bad. The teacher gave me the F. I was told in SEL class or whatever that, you know, if someone makes me feel bad, they have traumatized me. Mm -hmm. Right. If they overgeneralize this very simplistic lesson, like first level thinking. Because that's something children do. It's like a common thing that kids do. And especially kids who probably are developmentally delayed a little bit because of all of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The last couple of years. Then you're just pouring gasoline on a flame of something they're already inclined to do, which is not me, not me, right? right. I didn't do it. And now you're telling them that like people shouldn't make you feel bad. And if you feel bad, that impact of feeling bad is something the other person needs to be held accountable for. We keep hearing that, you know, accountability mm -hmm. for hurting someone's feelings and, you know, violating their, their feelings. Right. And I'm just wondering if the lesson the kids are taking away is teachers doing that to me. Right. Teacher gave right. me an F. I feel lousy about it. Teacher fault. Right. Well, I think that we have that issue as a society, and I think it's it's kind of like a microcosm with the schools. And and basically, what we're 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 looking at here is, you know, the, the I guess you'd say overall the two broad factions are teaching personal responsibility or teaching victimhood. Right. Um, and 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 you know, and you can't deconstruct your way to success. Um, you know, and and so we're 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 having kind of that that fight, and I think that teachers are torn up about it because. You know, if you listen, you know, when you sit in our, our teachers, um, we don't have a teacher's lounge. We have a, 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 a kind of a shared studio space where we have like I can sit with my fellow English teachers and work on stuff and share info of info. When you listen to them talk, they are frustrated. Um, you know, you see, by the way, you see a lot of things in the news right now or out there about teacher burnout and teachers are stressed out and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, that's that's a thing. You know, but my question to teachers is, well, why are you burnt out? What What is it that's actually burning you out? Um, is it the kid's behavior, the lack of discipline? What is it and what can you control that'll make, you know, what, you know, so on and so forth. But um, when you listen to teachers, they, what they're really complaining about is a lack of personal responsibility on the kids, you know. And that that in gen they may not verbalize it this way, but the way that I that I hear them say it is that the schools are not teaching personal responsibility. I right. mean, something simple. 
my students don't bring pencils to class. Mm -hmm. They don't bring supplies to class generally. Some do, you know, the ones that, that kind of get it. But I would say over half my students, um, you know, they don't come to, they, they're looking for me to provide them with a pencil, provide them with a notebook, provide them and, and so on and so forth. And, and here's the, 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 the kind of the catch 22 is if I don't give them a pencil, what are they going to do? They're going to sit there and do nothing. And then what are they going to do after that? They're going to blame you for not doing the work. Right. And right. this, uh, this started in elementary school and it started a very long time ago. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about pencils in school. I became, I got a reputation locally in Charlotte as the, 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 um, the pencil war woman, because when I first moved here, so this would be 2005. Um, I, I had, uh, my second, my first daughter was two and my second daughter was just being born. And, um, I didn't know anybody. So I joined something called the Charlotte mommies and it was a big discussion forum or whatever. And I didn't have school age children yet. And I planned to homeschool them, but I would, you know, just be poking around the forums and somebody commented on buying school supplies and the parents were all like, Oh, have you seen the list? And the list is so long and it's over $200, blah, 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 blah. And there was a whole list of, you know, a whole forum of discussion around school supplies and how, they were asking if they could, you know, do I have to get the Crayola crayons? They're just going to share them anyway. And so I venture in and I said, what do you mean they're going to share them? They said, oh, well, what happens is, you see, we buy the school supplies. And of course, my last memory was both as a teacher and a kid was, you know, you bring your own. And then we drop them off at the school, right? Mm -hmm. And they all get put into a communal pile of pencils and pens and markers and glue, whatever. It's not their child's specific glue, their child's specific pencil case or any of that. They, if they get pencils with their name on it, then they're allowed to have those separate, but everything else that you buy in the school, on the school list, you have to hand to the teacher who mixes it all. Mm -hmm. And so some of the parents were just like, well, if I'm going to, it's going to be mixed anyway, can I get the generics? And other people are like, well, you really, really frown upon that. You really shouldn't do that. And I'm sitting back while going, why is any of this happening? This is a terrible lesson for these children right. that they're just going to go to a communal pot. So of course, stupid me, I wander into the conversation and say, I think this is a moral hazard. I think this is a bad lesson for these kids. They're going to learn that nothing is theirs to take care of. Nothing is theirs to keep track of or, and, and make sure it doesn't, you know, break at loss, et cetera. They're responsible to bring a pencil or a pen. They're just going to go to the communal pot, go to the communal pot and all the way through fifth grade. At what point are they going to realize that they are responsible for their own supplies? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a simple question, right? right? And I ended up at the end of 15 pages of hate, literally it went on for 50, like next page, next page, 15 pages <laughs> of moms attacking me as a selfish person who hates the poor, wants kids to fail, uh, blah, 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 you name it. I mean, I was just run up the flagpole and they, the moderators came and blocked me <laughs> because I asked why they were doing, and I mean, it came back a couple times and said, but you see, and I kept trying to explain myself. Like yeah. I used to teach and this doesn't seem like a good idea. And here we are now it's 2021. So I, imagine this has been going on ever since, certainly in Charlotte, I would imagine other places where they do that. The, the list for school supplies is three pages long. You go to the target and it's, it's easily $250, $300 worth of supplies right. that include wet wipes and tissue and paper towels and hand sanitizer, you name it. And they just leave it at the school to be distributed to anybody's kid. And I, I asked some teachers, I said, do all the parents bring these supplies? They said most, but not all. I said, what happens with the kids who don't bring anything? Well, they just take from the others. And of course, predictably each year, there'd be mm -hmm. more kids whose parents are like, I'm not buying it. Right. They'll just have some at the school, right? And so what do we get? It's October. We're out of pencils. We're out of crayons. Yep. Can you parents bring some stuff in? So by the time you get them in sixth grade or seventh grade, they've never bought school supplies. Why would I need to? The school provides it. I couldn't even tell you if we have a school supply list because I had maybe one kid bring in anything. So... I don't know. I mean, and, and, and you know what happens too is I know it's kind of like 
the, the pencils lead to other things, right? I mean, people probably are thinking, well, they're talking about pencils. This is silly. Just give the kid a pencil. Well, I mean, you know, look at Aldi, for example, with their shopping carts. You gotta you gotta put in a quarter and 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 they have a pretty good return rate on their on their shopping carts, right? For whatever reason, they figure that out. Um, so what happens is let's go to the next level with supplies and every student at our school is given a one-to-one -one computer. You'd be blown away at how badly the students in general treat these computers. They drop them like crazy. They're constantly broken. You know, they, they, they really, they treat them like, like, like a pencil, you know, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise. And, and, you know, these districts are spending millions and millions of dollars giving these kids computers that they, they treat, you know, some kids well, take they care shouldn't of them. Be having, I'm sorry, but I, I am old school. I think we need to go back to paper. I've said it for years. I think it is disgraceful how much they rely on the one-to-one -one computers with, and Chromebooks for well, these kids. Get these kids off the damn Chromebooks. Well, let's, let's, let's use it to, to stay on focus with discipline because, yeah. You know, for especially for the boys, and, and, and this is for the parents to, to think about, is, um, well, I teach English, and we, bear, we, we will use the computers, but they're not allowed to have them open unless we're specifically using the computers for a very specific thing. Um, but yet, what do the boys want to do when they come in the room? They want to sit down, they want to play video games. They come in the building in the morning to our, our homeroom time and they want to play video games. Some of the boys even walk down the hallway with their computer open playing video games, you know, and, and it's become a massive. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many boys at lunchtime, you know, some boys go out and they play sports because they get a little bit of recess time, like within that right. lunch period. Half the boys, I would say, maybe a little less than sit down and play video games or watch YouTube videos. And they're doing it all day. So when you talk about classroom discipline, add that to the list of things that teachers are fighting against is kids. And, and when I was at the Catholic high school, we had just implemented one-to-one -one computing and it was the same issue. I had to arrange my classroom to where my desk was behind the students, the students in a row, so I could see their computer laptops when I was, see what they're doing on their computers. Um, and when I was in front of them lecturing or on, at the whiteboard, they either had to have their lid closed or mostly closed. Or if I saw their eyes darting back and forth, I knew they weren't doing what they're supposed to do. So those are more interruptions to the learning process. And, you know, I remember being that age with video games, by the way. Okay. And your brain, when you're locked into a video game as a, young, as a young kid like that, all you're thinking about are those video games and you become obsessed with them because you want to beat the next level. You're not focused on academics. No. And so you it, add that into the learning process. And th that's why I said the, the learning retention is not good. That's why we're seeing a lot of learning loss. Because what do you think boys, or not just boys, but what do you think kids have been doing for a year and a half when they've been Zoom schooling? You know, my wife, my wife, you know, stopped teaching this year. And she had a major issue with kids constantly going on to other sites and stuff during the class period. And it's so easy to tell, too. Even when I was teaching ESL, the Chinese kids, they were doing it. Yeah. So the parents will leave them alone with their own Chromebook or iPad or whatever and be like, okay, take your English class. And they'd go in the next room and I could totally see they'd have the camera on and they'd have, you know, this is like, I could see them, but they'd yeah. just open up another window and you could always tell because they'd be like, and the, the ones who wore glasses, it was the uh, funny could... <laughs> because I could totally see like the game <laughs> in their glasses. And I'm like, what are you watching? Or I would just stop talking. Yeah. I would, our class was 25 minutes and I would just stop and I'd be silent and wait and see how long it took for them to notice that I wasn't speaking. All of a sudden they'd be like, what, what, where'd you go? I'm like, oh, I'm here. I'm waiting for you to be done with your, with your yeah. video game. And that was even the Chinese kids. So I can only imagine what the American kids are doing. Yeah. I just think it's, I mean, I've said to parents before, you can, you can call me a relic, but I think you need to go back to notebooks and pens and so forth. And I, you know, no more, if you're going to take a class, that's delivered in a zoom situation, then, you know, there has to be a participation component. Right. Other, otherwise, you know, you, in other words, a part of the grade has to be you speaking and participating in the class as such as the teacher talking and you taking notes. Um, and I don't think it's a great way to do it anyway, honestly. Uh, so, but I, I just, I just wonder overall the lessons that we're teaching kids whether it's from the lack of discipline or the style of discipline that we're doing with the mm -hmm. restorative justice and SEL 
and, you know, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> right? right. Are you allowed to send anybody to the office? So we have a restoration room, which most would know as ISS. And we have a fantastic man that, that manages that. And um, the idea is that they, if they're really a, a pain in the butt in the classroom, um, the, the, the next tier up is to send them to that room where they sit and they, they sometimes will have a reflection piece they have to do. And sometimes they just need a timeout. And that does work for some kids, right? Sometimes kids get overloaded and they need a timeout. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and yes, they do go down to the office. Usually that's um, either they're caught doing something they shouldn't have been doing, like egregious in front of the administration, um, or it's a fight related piece. Um, so, so there is kind of a, a layer there and really the, our students at our school, at least they really only get suspended for, for like straight up fights. So, you know, so fair enough. Um, I, I so think sometimes get suspended for, so t if the student cusses you out, just like right mm, to your face in front of the whole class, is no. just streaming cursing. They won't no, not, not unless it goes to a certain level they the administration deems warrants a suspension. Usually it's going to be more of restoration ISS is where they go and stuff. And uh, sometimes for a whole day, um, you know, where they do stuff. But no, no, that, that stuff won't get, a, uh, you know. Now that's going to vary, right? Because at a Catholic school, like I've taught at or went to, that might get you suspended for sure, right? No, you know, okay. so... It, I, I think it's going to depend on how schools choose to operate. Maybe in, and I'm saying it won't happen at public schools either, you know, right. but, but so, yeah, I mean, students do swear at the teachers. They, I mean, swear words are all over the place and, and, and so forth, not necessarily directed at teachers. Um, but the, the potty mouth is definitely an issue. Big, a big issue. Yeah. Now, w w if you had to guess or guesstimate, you know, the percentage of your class period, on a regular basis that is given over to doing even low level discipline versus instruction. What would you say is the ratio? So 50 minute period. Um, there are days that I definitely feel like I got maybe 10 minutes of teaching in like good, solid educational focused educational time. I would say most of the time, maybe 30 out of 50 of good focus time. Um, you know, one of the things, surprisingly, that I found, so you go back you know, really quickly, go back to the computer stuff. And we actually have gone to what we call a lit, a lit notebook. So, you know, I went out and bought um, uh, composition mm -hmm. notebooks for them and stuff. And, and what we'll do is we'll do graphic organizers that I have them cut out and glue into the notebook. And you'd be surprised at how many kids don't even have that skill set at, at middle school, where mm -hmm. they have a hard time simply following directions of cutting stuff out and gluing it into a book. But I've found that that actually helps keep them focused. Right. So what they'll do is while they're doing that, I'll have something else that they're, even if to be social, I'll give them a question to talk about with their table while they're doing that and stuff. So that does help um, and, and so forth. And it kind of gets them moving and, you know, all that stuff. And there goes my silly camera again. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, it's tired, I think. It's okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to ask you a question while you're doing that. Um, yeah. so you're saying, so it kind of, it, it varies, but probably about 30 minutes of instruction, 20 minutes of low, low level discipline and some days worse. Um, and do you feel like this is a function of the specific school you're in or a sign of the times? I want to say it's more a sign of the times, to be honest with you. Um, you know, even cause I came from the university level and I'm, I'm I saw a lot of those same issues, even with the college kids. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I talked way early on about um, separating out normal middle school behaviors versus what's new in our culture. And a lot of this stuff, I think, is, is certainly new in the culture. I mean, mm -hmm. even even when you worked with, you know, let's let's say many years ago, you still had a level of respect from the kids to the adults. Right. Right. Um, you know, even even if you disagree with them, if you didn't like them, I mean, there's always that that percentage but the overall majority of the kids, um, they didn't, they knew they weren't your equal in terms of peer to peer right and now. They're treating you like peer to peer. Correct. They're, they're very much acting as if I'm their peer, not a, an, a caring adult type of position. To what you would know? you attribute that? Like, what do you guess that it is feeding that lack of deference just to the fact that you're the teacher? I think, well, 
some of this is going to be guessing, guesstimating. Um, I mean, some of these kids raise themselves, right? And, 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 and I'm not saying that just with the low socioeconomic kids, the poor kids. I've worked with very wealthy kids who were at home by themselves because their parents were off. You know, I had one, one uh, student whose parents would go off chasing the Grateful Dead on the weekends. And so they were gone like almost every weekend. Um, and she was left at home to take care of her little brother. Whoa. So, so you have babies raising babies, you know, no matter what the socio socioeconomic level is. And, and I think that, you know, the other part of it is, is that there are some teachers that get down to their level, which I think is misinterpreted in my opinion, um, you know, to be their, to be their friend. And I, and I've said this before, even when, again, when I was coaching college, I don't need a 19 year old friend and I don't need an 11 year old friend. Right. And I think that some teachers uh, cross that line too much as we've kind of seen in the news here and there. Um, so I think there's that level. And I think parents too, right. We're, you know, we all get guilty of this, but I think that there's parents that, um, try to be their kids' friends. So I think that there's a lot of dynamics as to why. And then I think that, you know, there's also some cultural influence. Right. I mean, they're seeing, as you pointed out, I mean, they're seeing things on TikTok and they're seeing things on Twitter that, um, you know, where, where kids are just mouthing off and not only getting away with it, but being seen as, you know, uh, it's like a social credit. Mm -hmm. Like if you if you talk back and you get away with it, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a, there doesn't seem to be a, a focus on um rewarding kids or, or valuing kids who are polite and respectful and, and all that. It just doesn't seem to be a, right. a, a societal norm at all. Right. Well, I mean, think about this and, and this, you know, again, relates back, tie it back to the computer stuff too, is, you know, where their incentives is where that, where uh, human beings, especially kids are going to go. Right. And, yeah. and, and the, the risk reward, and right now there's, there's really no risk, but there's a lot of reward for the misbehaviors and acting out, right? Cause what's right. the worst that's going to happen as long as you're not getting in a full out brawl is that right. you're just going to go to ISS for a little bit. You get out of class. So you know what that teacher's class I don't really like, guess what? Now I get to go sit in a room and avoid that class. And I get to avoid that teacher's, that teacher's room. And then, you know, the computers, we, we know from, from data that they've designed those games as if you're in Vegas. And we know that children's brain absorbs dopamine at almost 400 times the amount of an adult. And so we've got, you know, so you've got social media, you've got TikTok, you've got, you know, Instagram, which are the two main ones that the young kids are, 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 are absorbing. You got video games. So you have this dopamine kick constantly. And of course they can't focus in the classroom because they're so geared up for that dopamine kick constantly constantly so they're and, basically and, like drug addicts uh, i mean in, in a not, way not yeah. to make light of it but you know they they're dopamine addicts we're, it's almost like we're mass producing add mm -hmm. because the you know people think of add as attention deficit it's not it's a dysregulation of attention and so when you've got and, and obviously some people have it because neurologically they're wired that way but just at birth but I believe that similar to how we have so many kids now with dyslexia and many of them aren't really neurologically dyslexic, they have something I would call dystichia, like they've been improperly taught how to read. So they don't read because they weren't taught the mm -hmm. right way. I think we have a similar thing with ADD and especially as you point out with boys that, you know, they have been stimulated and stimulated and stimulated artificially, externally, not from in here but externally right. with these devices that have this, their, their brains are constantly awash in dopamine and anything that does not give them the same dopamine rush is not only boring, but literally puts them to sleep. Yep. And, and that's why you see, so let's, let's tie in a few of the, the stuff, you know, with the cultural, um, culturally rele relevant education, right. Uh, or culturally responsive kind of the same idea, but, um, Part of me gets what they're trying to do. They're trying to appeal to the kids. They're trying to appeal to these minority kids and, and try to figure out why they're not learning. Now, you and I know that what it's steeped in. We know that cultural responsive education, who, who created it and what their background is, et cetera. So we won't go there. 
but I, I get it. I get what they're trying to do uh, to, to some degree. Um, let's say on the surface, the problem is, is what you just talked about. These kids are so geared towards being entertained and we keep trying to shift what we're teaching them to appeal to them. And I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it, it's just, it's, it, you know, it's just it, education is, is highly prone to psychological fads. And if you look at the history of education, you know, back to the basics, the, you know, the read, write and, 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 and arithmetic and then and common core and, and no child left behind. I mean, every so many years we have these new fads and now we're in a new fad phase, which is culturally responsive, equity, diversity, inclusion and, and SEL. Right. And we're almost feel like we're starting to move way more towards the SEL than anything else. And we keep trying to fix this when. Maybe this, maybe, and I'm, I'm just, this is me kind of throwing stuff out here is maybe we need to get a grip on the kids and their technology usage and, and what they're doing. I mean, I I'm have a thinking, I don't know. Call me crazy. Well, I, maybe listen, we got to start teaching them to read properly using yeah. actual books. And then maybe we get the tech out of the classroom and maybe we really teach the parents, you know, like instead of having universal pre-K, we have universal parent instruction on how to not give your kids a smartphone when they're two. Well, we need to, right. We need to educate people in general. And I've done my own education. And again, I'm not perfect. I mean, I have a seven-year-old son and a nine-year-old daughter and, and they've now been grounded this week from tech because I noticed for, number one, I noticed that when my son is, is told to be off tech, he gets angry and throws a temper tantrum. And that's a big, you know, red flag for me personally. And so, you know, they did some things this week and we're like, no tech. And, you know, my daughter's last night slept the best that I've seen her slept, sleep in a while. You know what I mean? She didn't have nightmares. She didn't have this and that. And it's, it may not be related, but I've made notes, right? And I've read some books on um, a, a field that parents should look into. It's, it's called cyber psychology. And there's a book out by a woman who wrote, it's fantastic. And it talks about the kids. Um, and, you know, I think that that's something that educators need to become more aware of. And, and so forth. And like I said, there is a place for technology in the classroom. I just don't believe one-to-one -one is it. Right. And I think that you really work hard at teaching the kids. It's a tool, not a toy. Exactly. But I definitely think there's something there that's it's causing these kids. Right. It's, it's a constant bombardment of, of information that their brains are not equipped to handle. Well, and, and what gets me is sometimes people will say, you know, wh why do you have such a problem with education being engaging? That's their word, engagement, engaging. We want it, the education to be engaging. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I think you have an overly simplistic view of what engaging means, mm -hmm. okay? It's not, engagement doesn't mean there's lights and bells and whistles and, and animation. There are lots, I, I mean, I, a good book can be very engaging, all right? right? But it's that, when you when you tell a kid or you send the message that like you were saying discipline needs to be always like hearing what they have to say and reasoning with them and discussing with them and arguing with them when as you pointed out sometimes there's no argument don't hit someone mm -hmm. we don't we don't need to have a conversation about it there's no discussion necessary right. the answer is no okay right. and so the same thing with education is there's in, there's engagement and then there's entertainment and I feel like we're teaching the kids that all learning needs to be entertaining and passively so, so that, you know, whatever you're learning, the teacher's got to give it to you in a way that entertains you, not that you're going to go out and get it. And they, they're not learning such an important lesson, which is that, you know, there's a personal satisfaction that comes in learning something that when you go and find out, find the answers to questions or you improve a skill and you conquer you know, a hurdle that you had because something was difficult, let's say math or even grammar, and you just work at it and practice. They're not learning the level of discomfort right. they need to learn to actually learn. Right. Like you have to tolerate that silence. Sometimes silence is discomfort. Sometimes writing with a pencil when I'm not a very good writer right. is a kind of a discomfort that you need to get through. These kids don't know how to push through. No. And, and what's funny is we, you know, well, we're making them more resilient. No, no, we're making them more fragile. Very and important. because what we do is we keep, we keep lowering the standards because, well, they can't do this. So let's go and let's do entertaining things because we have to keep them engaged. And, and you're absolutely correct. The engaged, the interpretation is 
um, well, if they're if they're not having fun, they're not engaged. Well, right. you know what? Sometimes the best lessons of learning are not necessarily fun. And we we have these. I have these same exact conversations with my students, and I and I tell them. I said, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. Sometimes to really learn something, you need to sacrifice what you really want to do. You know, and, and we, we, we use that quote from Denzel Washington that I love, which is do what you need to do now so you can do what you want to do later. Right. Yeah. And the discipline piece. Right. With, you know, where discipline really does equal freedom, because if you do what you're supposed to do now and you be disciplined with what you're doing and not and not discipline in terms of you're in trouble, go to your room. But discipline, meaning that internal, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to sit down and I'm going to I'm going to get focused on this material and I may struggle. Um, you know, a story I tell with academic stuff and I tell this to my students is, you know, my sister went to the Coast Guard Academy, which is a very top tier academic school, especially ac across the military schools. And right. she finished dead last in her class academically. But the thing is, she graduated they lost 150 students out of out of 450 students or 350 students, whatever. So the point is, is that I, I tell that story to my kids saying, if you're working your butt off and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you may still only be a C plus student, but I will know and you will know. And in the long run, you're going to benefit because you're learning the work ethic that will make you highly successful years from now. Absolutely. And it, it's so much more important the that you actually see it through and you do the work and you keep trying as hard as you can. It's not the letter grade that you got. It's the just pushing through and right. getting through it. And that, you know, there is a value to that. And what I worry about is that all of these methods that they're using are teaching the opposite message that you need external resources in order to get through life. So mm -hmm. you're having problems in class. You can't get along with other people. Let's do a circle. You need, you know, you have to go to the, now, like you said, sometimes they need a timeout, whatever I get. But when we're talking about sometimes translating into maybe, you know, at least once a week for a given student or possibly right. more, or 20 minutes out of every 50 minute period is spent just not focused and not paying attention and hitting other people. That to me is not just, the vicissitudes of being sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Right. That is a cultural thing where I think the lesson they're learning from the style of discipline is there are no real consequences. So game the system, learn the system. And if you're so inclined, in other words, if your morality is such that you're going to game, the, you know, you're going to find the little ways out, you're going to find the ways out. And for the other students who might have come into school going, I'm, I'm going to respect a teacher. I'm going to listen. I'm going to do my thing. What's the lesson they're learning? Right. I can imagine, you know, being the kind of kid who's like, what's the point? Like, if I do what I'm supposed to do, then this class is going to be disrupted anyway. And I, you know, I mean, Th their perception of the value of doing it right goes down. Like their, right. their value goes down even for the kids who are inclined to do the right thing. Right. Well, because we know they don't see anybody getting in trouble. Yeah. Well, we, you know, we know from data that um, people are going to gra gravitate towards the lowest common denominator, right? Because your brain wants it easy. And, and you're right. If you see these students, they see that, well, so-and-so is acting up and, and he's not really getting in trouble and they're going to gravitate towards that way. It's like, um, you know, you, 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 if you take, um, you take a middle-class kid or even a, a wealthy kid and you put them in a, in a poverty mindset area, um, they're going to gravitate towards poverty. You know, you're not going to have the other kids look at the wealthy or the, or the middle-class kid and go, I'm going to work hard like him right? You, you, you tend to go down, not it's, it's right. It's like a mountain, right? You know, you, you um, it's, it's much harder to climb up. It's way easy to go down. Well, and if you don't see people working this, this happened to me when I went into public school, I was at Montessori till I was about eight, then went into public school. And even back in the paper and pencil days, um, I didn't really see other kids doing homework or doing things because, you know, we do what we're told in the class or we do what was going on in the class. And then, you, whatever activities, and then you go home and you don't necessarily see the, what the other kids are doing. And because the teacher didn't really, even then, so even in the seventies, they still weren't like, all right, let's go over the homework or let every, you know, everybody mm -hmm. turn it in and let's look at this. We didn't, we didn't really have a window into what 
how other kids were actually performing or how they were actually doing. So you only saw, you know, the loudest and most disruptive, or maybe the teacher's pad was raising their hand, but like the vast middle, they just look like, you know, just kids sitting there putting up with whatever was going on. And there, you know, it was public school. So there was a fair amount going on. Well, I went all the way through ninth grade in public school and I had very mediocre grades. I was kind of phoning it in. I wasn't really working very hard. I I, I did well in English and history because I liked them, but everything else, it was like barely scraping by. But I thought my peers were doing the same because what I saw in class was everybody else goofing off and everybody else was doing whatever or right. so I thought because you see what you what is in your face. Well, when I went to private school, sophomore year, I did the same. I was kind of like, just so I guess everybody's doing their thing, whatever. Um, no, no, it wasn't like that at all because I lived there. I got to see, you know, had a roommate sitting there doing their homework. I go to the library, everybody's doing their homework. And I'm like, what are y'all doing? And it was so bizarre to me that they had these habits because they'd been in private school longer. They had habits that I had to start from scratch in 10th grade, learning Mm -hmm. how to have that kind of self-discipline. Now, thank goodness. I got those three years and I learned it. Yeah. But what it taught me is that you will, as you said, you will just sort of copy what you see. You'll just see what's going on around you and you go to the lowest common denominator and you kind of hang out there and you kind of coast there. And as long as nothing really bad's happening, we just what's your incentive to work any harder? Right. There isn't a social pressure too. When I was in the other school, the social pressure was work. It because they were. Does nobody mm-hmm. want to talk to you? Shh, I'm doing my work. I'm like, oh, okay. So yep. I might as well do mine, right? Right. So that that was a big eye-opening experience for me that I brought then into my teaching is that you that if the kids aren't seeing it happen with their peers, mm-hmm. they aren't going to see it. And with the Chromebook focus, at least you look over, you see somebody writing at a piece of paper, right? Yep. But everybody knows everybody. I'm gaming. I'm gaming. I'm doing the thing. I'm sending notes. What I'm ch- I'm chatting. I'm texting. So, what's your motivation to be a good student? It's either coming from within, or mom and dad no. are like, or it's nowhere. No. Well, and you know, we. I'm going to speak about the population that I'm I'm working with and serving at the moment, and and very much what you talk about because I had a very similar experience in grade school where. I went to a Catholic school. My mom was teaching at another one. Parents get divorced. So I go to the school my mom's working at because of free tuition. Come to find out that the act, it was an interesting dynamic where I was a year ahead of my classmates when I transferred to that other Catholic school. And it it showed too in there, like you said, the work habit there. I ended up having to go back to the other school for my eighth grade year just to, just to make sure that I was where I needed to be academically. Um, But um, the, the, you know, we, you, you take your example of, of you, you had two different dynamics of kids that were stu- studying their butts off and then the other kids that you wouldn't know if they were or not, right? You, you never got, to, whether they may have, but you didn't know it outside of the school. Um, when I have students that, and I quote, I'm not going to do homework because I have better things to do after school. And that's, that's the perception. So when we talk about, well, we want to get these kids out of poverty. We want to get our, our inner city, you know, urban kids and get them elevated to go to college and stuff. Well, no, they're not learning the skills. I, again, I worked at the university level. I just left that. I watched um, a couple soccer players sit in the office that I shared with the soccer coach and they were doing seventh grade math as freshmen in college. And I know that because I taught that math. Right. And they couldn't get through it. Right. And here they are in college. Now, kudos to those kids. They were in that room trying to learn it. Right. But we're sending kids to college that can't even do seventh and eighth grade math. I tutored They're student not, athletes. I yeah. tutored them. That's one of the things I did at, at Northwestern when I was living in Chicago. And Northwestern is, you know, a really good school. Right. It's very hard to get into. Sure. But like every other school, they have a football team, they have a basketball team, whatever. And so they had a program and these kids, uh, these student athletes had because of their division and everything and their, the conference they were in, they were required to maintain a certain average or they would not be able to play. So it was to their advantage to go take advantage, take advantage of tutoring, which was paid for by the school. And I tutored, uh, English and, um, business, which was just, they would take classes that were things like business writing. So Mm -hmm. it was mostly business writing. And, 
that was my experience that my student athletes and they would be, you know, sophomores and juniors. Um, they weren't freshmen. These guys were middle school level mm -hmm. on their reading and writing. Absolutely. They were so far behind and yet there they were at Northwestern. Yep. And so, and that's when they're athletes. But what I'm hearing is that more and more kids are graduating with these sort of fake C averages that like really they should have failed. Yep. But they're not really teachers are, you know, disinclined to fail them or they're being disincentivized to fail them. And they give the go, just give them a C. Like a C is what an F used to be. <laughs> and then they go to college and they're getting in to sort of, you know, their state school or whatever. And I feel like we're setting them up to fail because they go there and what could they possibly do there? Yeah. Well, and that's, that's my point. It's not so much that the, I, mean, I want to be clear here that, you know, if college is the right path for people or that's the path they need to be on, then so be it. Right. Obviously I'm a big fan of trade schools as well. Right. right. Um, you know, and I have several family members that are that are making that are very high and very successful in their fields. And they don't they only have a high school diploma. You right. know, one's a farmer, one's a CEO and et cetera. But um, so there are way different paths. My point is, is that we so we're seeing all this social um, um, what am I, you know, increase in mental health. And what people do is they're trying to treat mental health, which needs to be treated. But what they're not treating is the underlying reasons. Why are, is there so much mental health issues with our, with our, let's say our college students, for example, it's exactly right. what you say that they are not able to handle college level schoolwork. And yet there they are. And then on top of that, they've had, I'm telling you for sure, the fake grades. I mean, these grades are fake in general. They're fake. You know, right. the kid did the assignment. He literally did the assignment. Okay. Here's a hundred percent. Right. Um, and so these kids are going off to college thinking, I'm an A-B student, I'm an A-B student. They get to college and they're in remedial classes yep. and they're failing. Yep. And they're failing and they're failing and they don't go to class because in the college you don't have to go to class and so on and so forth. And, and so, you know, because no one's making them do stuff and let's come full circle. They're not disciplined. No. Nope. And they weren't expected nope. to be disciplined. And so, you know, we've just passed them on. And we've, we've given them a false sense of hope and, and so forth that or accomplishment. Right. And that just says, you know, because when people hear the word discipline, they think of, you know, punishment, consequences, just that we have talked about that on this, this show. But we're also talking, um, just make sure everybody understands, about personal discipline, self-discipline. Yep. There's There are different kinds of discipline. You have to be able to discipline yourself after a point. And that's one of the things that begins, I would actually argue it begins in fifth grade, um, in the second half of fifth grade. And it starts to pick up steam in middle school because the idea is to prepare you to be completely independent for high school. Right. Because even though it isn't the case anymore that you're done when you get your high school diploma and you can just, you know, you're, you're off and you can live your life, although it, it, it used to be. And for people going to the trades, it is right. Mm -hmm. But now they've made like colleges like high, what high school used to be. But it's if you're if you're going to be an 18 year old legal adult and you don't have the self-discipline, the personal discipline to just complete your homework for high school, even at a C level, like a literal, a real C, not mm -hmm. a fake C. Like I tried really hard, but I just couldn't quite get above average. OK, um, then I mean, what exactly are you prepared for in the adult world? Not right. a lot. No, that, that's a level of self-discipline. You need to show up at a job on time consistently and and be responsible when there. Right. And, and I mean, think about this. I mean, how many industries are mechanizing? Right. Yeah. So and I talked about this with my students recently because we have a major tardy problem at our school. And again, it's not it's not everybody. Right. Um, and we've we've put some things in place to help solve that issue. And it's working. Um, right. But we still have some students that they're come strolling in 10 minutes after after the bell. You know, or, or or we use music, but it's the same idea. Um, and it's just kind of like detention eh. a thing anymore, or is that gone? No, that's not a thing. Now, it, now at the Catholic high school, it is, but it's still that's, it's not. I, I hate to sound like some kind of ogre, but you know there there are consequences and there are consequences. Okay, yeah. I'm not a big fan of like arbitrary you know punishments, but I think if you're the type of person showing so little respect for your classmates, for your teacher, for yourself. 
that you just come consistently strolling in 10 minutes late without an excuse. Like, it's not like you're running, you know, like mom dropped me off late, but this is every day. Just kind of like, eh, whatever. I just, you know, meandered right. into the classroom. I think that warrants some after school detention. I think that warrants some time in study hall or something like where you have to, you know, give up some of your free time. Right. Because you took away time from other people. Because when somebody comes in 10 minutes late, that's disruptive. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. That's and, not, and not an okay and, thing to do. And not just the classroom. It's just they, just they just miss 10 minutes of learning, right? And if that happens over a week, that's 50 minutes. And if it happens over several right. weeks, we're talking hours of missed class time by that student. And it's exactly. all, you know, you know, when I went to high to, to the Catholic high school, our detention was seven um, was seven a.m. on a Saturday morning. Yeah. And what you were doing was you were cleaning the football stadium and you were cleaning the basketball stadium and so forth. Let me tell you, at least for this guy, I didn't get detentions because I got I I, I, I didn't want to test my first year of private school because yeah. it was all so new to me. Like, wait, we we study like we have to, do, you know, no. and then. I just thought I'd do okay because, you know, I was like, okay, it was a C, B minus kind of student. So I figured I'll go to class, take notes, I'll be fine, right? I didn't know how to study. I didn't even really yeah. know how to take notes properly. And so I failed this test and I had to do what's called Friday night study hall. So while everybody else I knew and you're, you know, sophomore in high school, they were going to a movie or they were doing whatever else on campus because, you know, we had movies and things. I had to sit in a room above the gym with like five or six other kids, none of whom I knew, and a teacher who didn't want to be there. Like the teachers made, you know, had mm -hmm. like a rotation. And I had to sit there for two hours on a Friday night doing homework while everybody else was having fun. Never happened again. It was like, expensive. It was, hu it was expensive. It was my free time, but it was yeah. humiliating. Right. That was a big, and, and don't underestimate the value of humiliation. Well, but with teenagers. And, and it was, it was a, but it wasn't like a, like an open humiliation, right? No, I mean, it was like, I mean, the only people that knew were you and the other kids that were there, unless you right. told people. Right. right. But that's, but that's the point though, is it's kind of like, well, where were you? And realizing like, you don't really want to admit it. And, and here's the key that I only had myself to blame. Yeah. I only had myself to blame. And to, so they don't sound like ogres. Friday night study hall also came with a note from my science teacher saying, you know, I'm available to tutor you. So mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not just punishing you. I want you to understand that you need extra time to do your homework because you're not right. doing it. But if you don't understand, that's a different issue and we'll, you know, whatever. Yeah. But because the teachers there made themselves so available, there was almost no excuse for failing a test. So that was my fault. And that's what we're missing. We're missing the sense of, as you said, personal responsibility. And people will say, you know, like we said at the beginning, well, they're only in sixth grade. Yeah. So you start small. Mm -hmm. You start small with, you need to bring your own pencil to class. Right. Mm -hmm. You need to right. bring your own pencil to class. So it's not all the way up at like, you know, it's a hundred percent your fault that you failed to test. <laughs> it, it's, it's down at pencil. Where, where's your pencil? And you didn't show up on time. So if we could focus on these basics and hold them to these kind of standards, then you work your way up to, okay, and now we add on this other stuff. But if right. we can't even expect the kids to bring a pencil and show up on time, well, how are you ever going to expect them to do the higher level uh, personal responsibility stuff of, of high school? <laughs> Well, guess what? This will probably be the last time because we're gonna we're gonna wrap stuff up. So then you can go have dinner. <laughs> my, my my poor camera. I'm telling you, I gotta. I apologize to everybody. It's 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 okay. it is what it is. It is what it is. It's right. Okay. It's... So, so what did we laugh. did we did we cover everything that you wanted to talk about or like did I miss anything? Did we miss anything? I don't. We covered a lot. It's 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 a lot. You know. I think. I think what you just said there is is the scaffolding of behaviors, and I think that um, you know, I'd say schools, school districts, you know, go from the classroom up, right? Um, I think people are trying to sort out what's going on, and maybe you know, I've said this, you know, a little bit after all the the real big COVID stuff, right? The big lockdowns. And when we started to see the stuff coming out about the schools, right, that parents were at home with the Zoom sessions and, and so on and so forth. And what we see, what we saw play out with Loudoun, Virginia and so forth um, is it exposed some things 
that hopefully people in the education world will step right. back and go, oh, wow, okay, we need to fix this, this, and this. I um, hope so. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> well, I think that the schools that will excel or continue to excel will, or the parents that excel, right? I mean, so I know you have a, a, a good population of homeschooling parents. And so that's why some of these things I want to make sure parents understood as they're working with their children at home, whether they're homeschooling or not, right? Right, sure. Is, is I, I believe as an educator that's done a little bit of research on both neuroscience and, and psychology and so forth, yeah. that I have, I have concerns about how the technology is messing with our kids, especially in their learning abilities. And yeah, again, no. I, you know, I know I'm not, I'm, I'm more of a layman on that, but you know, those are my inclinations from what I see that it's, I it's think that's common sense. And I, and I think, you know, we, we, you can study and you can read up on brain science and all that, but when it comes right down to it, come on, mom and dad, use your gut. Yeah. Does and I'm not anti-tech. No, nor am I. Um, but you know, put some, put some limits in place, have the thing shut itself down. Like my kids have you know, on the screen time thing, it, it, they, they have a maximum mm -hmm. amount of time that they're, the, the thing just stops working. So it's like, if they use up that hour, it's that you're holding what's basically a phone. I mean, an actual, just all it does now is make phone calls because all the other stuff that you were trying right. to do on it, you used up your hour, you're done. So there are things that you can do to the phone or to the computer. There are uh, screen time apps that you can put, uh, extensions you can put in browsers that, you know, literally lock and make inaccessible certain sites yep. that suck their time. Um, there are all kinds of things you can do to, to help limit that. But a lot of parents don't even realize that they exist. And that's, that needs, that's why I said, we need, we need education for parents, right. I think, um, as much as for the kids. And then just be, I, I just think that what I took away from this conversation is that it sounds good. SEL, restorative justice, whatever, because it, it is good when it's focused on the individual, mm -hmm. when it's focused on the individual, personal responsibility, personal growth, like from you outward, it has potential. It has morphed through this social justice movement into something where it's how do you fit into the, into the collective right. and everything is outside in. And the kids, I think, are taking away messages of like, how can I be a victim? Well, and that's something else that parents with? that I wanted to, you know, alert parents to when we talk about cultural responsive education and SCL, there is a lot of collectivist language in there. And and if you're, you know, you follow any of us on Twitter, you'll you'll see people that it's in our kind of on our network post stuff to that effect where there's a compare and contrast between individualism and collectivism and those things, especially, especially transformative SEL, they're really pushing the collectivist mindset. Right. Um, and, and, and if, if SEL stays at the, you know, individual responsibility and so forth, then, then, you know, fantastic. Um, right. And so forth. But when you start talking about group identities, and, and collectivism, that's that's the problem because well, it's and, not going to. And when SEL goes to, you know, screenings and questionnaires yep. that are then that then kids get so-called targeted supports based on a questionnaire, which a kid can just flub. I mean, kids, my kids told me, oh, we remember getting those when we were in public school. We just lied. And I'm mm -hmm. like, they don't. So you, they're taking it as if they're telling the truth and they could make stuff up. So that's the thing is if kids get the message that. Oh, there's value in saying I'm sad, I'm depressed. I'll get out of class. I'll go to the little therapy session. I'll go to the right. little restorative thing, and I don't have to sit in class. And then I'll get all kinds of excuses. Oh, this one's depressed. And I'm like, because we they they're on social media. They see in the profile like I have general anxiety disorder. I have bipolar disorder. I have this. I have that. Like as right. if these are badges of honor. And so if they figure out what questions, it's not complicated, guys, to figure out how to answer the questions to make it sound like you're sad, or depressed, or right. have a problem. So they fill this stuff out thinking maybe this will get me out of class and they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize what they're doing. They could end up on medication. So this is pretty dangerous. We've gone from let's have some breathing exercises and teach kids how to like manage emotions so they can actually function in class and right. work through frustrations and persevere and be resilient to how can they be fragile and, uh, you know, I'm a victim. And that's in a completely different thing. And you might come up against people who say, What's your problem with collectivism? Like that just sounds like you're selfish. You you just selfish. You want everything to be up with the individual. No, no. Hear me. 
I'm talking about whether a person is inner directed or outer directed. Is your locus yeah. of control inside of you or is your locus of control outside of you? What your politics yeah. are, how much you want to give in the community, what a generous person you are. No, no, that's totally separate. Some of the most right. individualistic people I know are some of the most generous people I know. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how do you see yourself and your mm -hmm. life and its value. And if you evaluate yourself and your value only as far as other people tell you things and say things right. to you and react to you, you are powerless. You are disempowering a child. And yes. if on the other hand, you tell the child like you are powerful and you have the power to control your emotions, to control how hard you work, you can't necessarily control your grade, but you can change how hard you work. You can change your focus. You can change your direction from today to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow could be a better day because of you, nobody else. And that's the difference between right. the collectivist lesson and the individualist lesson. It's nothing to do with selfishness or anything like that. Right. And that's, and that's a big picture thing, right? That's going on in our culture right now is we're kind of, we're, we're really fighting over, you know, the, the collectivism piece versus the individual. And when you, when you teach kids in SCL, that uh, that their identity, right? Well, what what are your identities? And we start and then we start bringing in intersectionality, which has been used in my school, and we start to get these kids to to one dissect themselves on all their um, identities, and then you start to bring in the transformative SEL where there's whiteness, this or or you know whatever this and so on and so forth. When you get kids to identify with certain collectivist groupings. Anything yeah. said negative towards that group, they take it as an absolute personal ins uh, insult, right? And then that's where you have microaggressions and all this other stuff. And then you, you know, you you see what's playing out on the big picture is the and then same. Then you stuff. have more fights, and then you yep. have more. I can hit you. Yep. I can walk past you and hit you in the back of the head, and I can do this and I can do that because. They've been given 15 different justifications by the adults. Correct. It's, it's just, it's very much, um, uh, I'm with my students. I'm reading a, a novel on I am Malala, which is about the young lady from, from Pakistan. And very much, it feels like her, her time living in Pakistan in the early, you know, like the 2010 ish time, you know, where there's this, this idea of an eye for an eye type of retaliation of anything that's said against your group is a is a, a personal insult that de demands revenge and saving That's reg face. It's regressive. Yes. That yes, we, it's very that regressive. Is, that is taking people that is taking America and Americans back. I would go argue uh, you know, some people would say well, Hatfields and McCoys, okay, so we did have that. But I'd say you'd have to go back even to before the founding of the Republic because yeah. we were founded in the Enlightenment and we just didn't do that kind of tribal thing. In fact, the country was formed because was able to form because we were right. not tribal and so you know that's just and and again it, it, it's in the curriculum it's everywhere mm -hmm. so we could have a whole other show on that topic oh yeah sure we, we could we've already i've i've <laughs> monopolized two hours of your life on a weeknight so oh no it's a pleasure um so, i just, yeah. i appreciate that you came on and and had this conversation because it's always good to hear from a teacher an actual teacher who's in the classroom dealing with these things every day and I really appreciate that you shared this with, with me and my audience and folks who are watching. If you know of parents who are, you know, curious about what goes on in terms of discipline in the class, please share this with them or alert them to its existence. And I thank you all for coming. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll have Ryan back again to talk about yeah. another topic. I'm sure soon. Yeah. I'm going to go discipline so. my camera now. So <laughs> yeah, go discipline your camera. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody for coming. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye.